Ivy Schweitzer is a professor of English and creative writing and past chair of women's gender and sexuality studies at Dartmouth College. Her fields are early American literature, American poetry, women's literature, gender, gender and cultural studies, and digital humanities. She is the editor of the Occam Circle, a di digital edition of works by the Samson Occam, an 18th century Mohegan Indian writer and activist, and co-producer of a full-length documentary film entitled It's Criminal, A Tale of Prison and Privilege. Um, based on the courses she co-teaches in and about jails um, here at Dartmouth, It's Criminal is a transformational documentary about privilege, poverty, and injustice that asks viewers to think about who is in prison and why. Um, uh, most recently in 2018, she blogged weekly about the year um, 1862 and the creative life of Emily Dickinson and recently co-edited edited a collection of essays in honor of the Occam Circle titled Afterlives of Indigenous Archives. She's currently collaborating on a poetry manuscript entitled Emily Dickinson in the 21st Century, Black Lives Matter. I'll share um, uh, a link to its criminal, um, but with, for, without further ado, I will pass it off to Ivy. Thank you so much, Yolanda, um, for all your hard work and all the uh, um, interns who've worked so hard to bring the LA Summit together. It's so important to build community, especially um, at, at this moment. And also, I would like to say, let's act on those land acknowledgements um, by investigating the Red Deal, which I just learned about today, um, because it's Earth Day. Um, and we have a lot to learn from our indigenous brothers and sisters. So I'm gonna introduce the panelists. I'm so excited that they're here. Um, they will give a brief introduction of the work that they're doing as part of their organization. Then we'll have conversation, questions and answers, et cetera. So we're gonna to start today with Sam Lewis. Sam Lewis is the executive director of the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, ARC. Previously, Sam served as the director of Inside Programs, a former life prisoner himself, Sam understands the various obstacles, challenges, and difficulties the prison and reentry population face. In 2017, Sam created the Hope and Redemption Team, a first of its kind initiative he built from scratch. Hart is a group of nine California life prisoners who go back into California state prisons to provide hope, demonstrate that redemption is achievable, and prepare participants for successful reentry into our communities. His work directing heart exemplifies what's best about ARC, its desire to reach and walk with those who have been most marginalized by society. Most Saturday nights, Sam leads the hope and redemption mentors who support youth currently housed at the Barry J. Nidoff Juvenile Hall. These youth are facing potentially long prison sentences. The unique mentors are trained in transformative mentoring and use a peer-to-peer credible messenger model to encourage incarcerated youth to believe in themselves and pursue their education while incarcerated. Sam previously worked with friends outside Los Angeles County as a job specialist, case manager, employment programs, supervisor, and project director, roles that reinforced his commitment to creating opportunities for formerly incarcerated men and women as they transition back into society. In 2018, Sam was the recipient of a Bank of America Neighborhood Builders Award, Uncommon Laws, Uncommon Heroes Award, and the 2019 Danger Man Award. So we welcome you, Sam, and please um, tell us more about your organization and your work. Thank you so much, Ivy. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, Nick, could you pull our uh, slides up? So. Uh, the mission of the Anti-Recidivism Coalition is to end mass incarceration in the state of California. And we do this in a number of different ways. Uh, first, just to be clear, our organization is member-led. Before I was the executive director, I was a member, and our membership is formerly our formerly incarcerated people. Juveniles, adults, men, women, non-binary, everyone uh, that has experienced the impacts. It, it's, Nick, you have a Slack channel. <laughs> uh, and so uh, our mission to, to end mass incarceration is done uh, by providing a support network made up of formerly incarcerated people. Uh, so we support each other in a number of different ways. One, by providing resources and opportunities uh, that are unique to ARC in many different ways. Uh, for instance, in this first, fire, uh, this first slide, this is our Ventura Center Firefighters Camp. 
This is the first ever of its kind firefighters camp that was created for people that fight fires or firefighters that are incarcerated to come home from incarceration and immediately go into a training program that allows them become, to become cow wildland firefighters. Last year, we passed the bill to ensure that these men and women would have the opportunity to also get their EMT license. This was just one of 27 pieces of legislation that we passed over the past eight years. Uh, last year, California's worst fire season in history, 30 men were on the fire line that were formerly incarcerated, certified cow wildland firefighters. In fact, Phi, one of these men, was burned severely. He survived. And when I visited Phi, his words were, this is what my life was meant to be. Uh, next slide, uh, Nick. Uh, we also offer rehabilitative programs inside the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitations. The slide to your far left is a graduation from Pelican Bay Shoe Program, the only supermax in the state of California. And what's unique about this particular uh, picture in the far left is normally these men would not be able to be sitting next to each other as they come from a, a number of different uh, areas that basically gangs. We had made so much progress, we were able to bring this entire group out to graduate. Some of these men have now come home and have reintegrated back into society. Uh, the other pictures are also maximum security graduations from our Hope and Redemption team led by formerly incarcerated people running rehabilitative programs that we created that we also used to, to find our way home. Next slide, please, uh, Nick. When people come home, one of the most important things next to housing and therapy is employment. We created the first uh, pre-apprenticeship, successful pre-apprenticeship building trades program. We've now put over 300 people in the building trades, in the careers, union jobs in Los Angeles and OC building trades. Literally a person can walk out of prison today and in 14 weeks find themselves earning 40 to $50 an hour. And they have the opportunity, of course, to, to become independent contractors based on their skill set. Uh, again, over 300 people. Uh, these are just three of our, our programs. Next slide, uh, Nick. Uh, in the past eight years, ARC has passed 27 pieces of legislation. We have 10 in the queue for this legislative cycle. Uh, to give you a couple of examples of some of the legislative uh, 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 bills that we passed, uh, we ended life without the possibility of parole for juveniles in the state of California. Uh, we created the first ever in this nation Miranda rights for juveniles. We're now working to push this law nationally so that a Central Park Five incident will never occur with any of our, our young people again, ever. Uh, the other laws include everything from uh, college opportunities for college. Now every prison has at least one yard that has a face-to-face -face college program in the state of California. Uh, next slide, please. That may be the last slide. The one slide that we don't, we don't have on here is our housing uh, program. So our housing program, we have two different types of housing programs. One, is housing for people who have done long terms and housing for young people who are in the juvenile system. Both are geared toward the, towards these separate populations. And we make sure that people while they're incarcerated have the opportunity to be able to plug into these programs once they're released and while they're incarcerated. Based on lived experience of being incarcerated 24 years, we know that re-entry starts, or, or re-entry and being prepared to come home starts while you're still incarcerated. Uh, today, California will be closing two prisons, one this year, DVI, and next year, Susanville. The first time in over 40 years that California will close prisons. We'll, we'll all be, we will also be closing all the D Department of Juvenile Justice facilities. I won't say that ARC is responsible for all of these closures, but we played a major role because the laws that we passed have impacted thousands. Uh, on the screen, you might see a gentleman by the name of Mark Taylor. Mark Taylor is one of our life coaches that actually went through our program, came home, interned for us. After he interned, we hired him, and now he works in Pelican Bay State Prison, facilitating the exact same groups that helped him come home. And now Joseph just popped on. These, these two gentlemen live in Crescent City, the furthest city in California, at, uh, located near the only Supermax prison. Uh, when we talk about shrinking the prison system, we have to do two things, three things. One, we have to prepare people to come home. Two, we have to pass policies to be able to make sure that people are successful when they come home. And three, we have to make sure that they have the resources necessary for when they come home, they don't have to go back to the hustle game, so to speak. They literally have an opportunity to truly become the best version of themselves. I thank you for this opportunity to present. Amazing work, Sam. And 
welcome to Mark Taylor. It's great that you're passing on the, the knowledge and the, and, the, and the work and the inspiration. Our next speaker is James Nelson um, of the organization Dignity and Power Now. James Nelson was confined within the prison industrial complex at the age of 19. During his 29 years inside Soledad State Prison, he actively participated in self-help groups like Life Cycle and DPN's success stories, where he became close with DPN's board member, Richard Amon Vargas. Upon James's release, he immediately became involved in Dignity and Power Now, and quickly found himself working full-time as an organizer, where he shares his story daily with other formerly incarcerated people. Having only been home for two years, James has lost his mother to pancreatic cancer and his sister to domestic violence, and we really um, we acknowledge that loss, and we are sorry for that. Despite these numerous personal challenges, James provides DPN with lots of laughter and positivity and still feels strongly that it is his duty as a former gang member to help correct problems within Los Angeles's communities. So James, please tell us more about your organization. Yes, thank you, thank you. Yeah, um, well, DPN is um, Dignity and Power Now, right? We stand with um, uh, incarcerated folks in the community, right? And, and, and just listen to our community and, and the things that they want and the things that they need, like here in LA. Um, um, and, and DPN is the parent company to a, 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 a collective, a bigger collective here in LA called Justice LA. Justice LA is 30 other organizations that's collaborating to make changes here in LA. Uh, but, um, DPN started off um, with, with a jail fight plan that they had here in LA recently, where they wanted to build two new jails uh, here in LA, uh, two new twin towers, and then uh, a new jail in Lancaster for women facility. In the jail in Lancaster, the, the soil had been tested by environmental impact, and um, it came back positive for valley fever, but it had uh, been passed, and um, the go ahead had already been sent off, but uh, we in the community kept going to the Board of Supervisors fighting that uh, we did not want this jail. Uh, we spoke to the community, the community said that they didn't want the jail. And then it was for the cost uh, taxpayer $4.5 uh, million. Dollars. So, uh, you know, the community spoke and uh, we stay adamant about the fight and we end up stopping the jail fight, stopping two jails from being built but then also a conversation start with the board of supervisors and shift the narrative from even talking about building jails to talk about alternative to incarcerations. So these are uh, uh, um, now in the beginning station of implementing these uh, uh, alternative to incarcerations. And, and what an alternative to incarceration is, is a, a community-based organization that's already been rendering services to our communities that um, these community members was being victimized and, and criminalized for, for being houseless, right? You go to jail for being houseless, uh, for having a, a drug addiction, you go to jail. Those are things you shouldn't go to jail for. But we know that in the black and brown communities that these are some of the things that people was being, uh, 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 being um, jailed for. So uh, uh, we um, now trying to get um, some of those fundings that was going to go towards those jails uh, reallocated to the community members that's had already been rendering this kind of service. And then, uh, as I spoke earlier about uh, uh, programs that I directly do, and uh, that's uh, um, a program called Drilly, Dandelion Rising Leadership Institute. And it's a juvenile program. It's a leadership building curriculum where, where uh, we work with the students in the local high schools. And a lot of these students already have their own campaigns going students deserve, students not suspects. And um, we, we uh, support them and they support us, you know, in uh, uh, helping trying to uh, um, get some of the changes that we wanna see, not just in our schools, but in our communities. Because again, here in LA, um, we know that uh, uh, the school to prison pipeline, right, is, is alive and well. So uh, we just trying to throw uh, interference on that and also trying to get the police out of our schools because uh, we know here in LA, uh, Thank God it have not been like random mass shootings in our local high schools, but yet and still we are the schools that's 
over police, you know, uh, uh, by me having a relationship with students in the school and teachers. Uh, I know about one incident at Dorsey High School where a, a young lady student was victimized by the police because he had a, 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 a fight with another student and he body slammed her and, uh, you know, it, 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 it just wasn't right. But it was also repercussions to one of the teachers because she could not stand and see one of her students get body slammed by a police. So those are some of the things that we do collaborations with uh, um, the students campaigns here in LA, but I also do a formerly incarcerated program for folks coming home from prison and, uh, and, and it's a leadership building curriculum as well. And we just enlighten them on the work that's going on in the communities and how they can plug into it and uh, 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 be a difference in their communities. Because we know as former lifers, one thing that we all vow that we want to do is come home and, uh, uh, um, and, uh, and give back. And I, I don't know no greater way of giving back than side by side with people that was fighting for us when we was inside of prison without a date, not knowing if we would ever come home. You know, uh, 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 I commend all the brothers that 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 stayed the course and, and came home and out here and um, trying to be a change in our communities because uh, it's a lot of work that still need to be done. This is and um, something else that we're doing right now too is. Um, Sahara was supposed to also be on here, so I'm gonna save it for her because she might speak more on the programs and work that they do with the uh, families that uh, we also support in, uh, up on the DPN. But that's it, uh, some of the things that I do at DPN along with uh, Justice LA and uh, as far as um, participate with the Board of Supervisors meeting, the civilian oversight committees, and just being right in the community. Cause I'm the kind like, I like to be, where they say the problems are. Because if I'm where they say the problems are, who knows, I can have a conversation with somebody and resolve some th something that could have been an issue. So that's some of the work that's really been going on in South Central in uh, LA area and Watts, uh, where we meeting with our uh, former gang members that's formerly incarcerated, that turn their life around, that have their own homes, but they care about their community. So they come back to their communities and then in the meetings, they bring their young homeboys that's actually active in the communities, the ones out there that's harming our communities. And they bring these guys to these meetings and they sit there, they break bread and eat with us and they see their OG homeboys, how they interact and laughing and talking and having good conversation and sharing resources. So now it creates, now when they see each other in the streets, they are less likely to attack each other. So this is something that we've been trying here and uh, it has worked, but uh, you know, we, we got a lot more work to do, but uh, I'm just glad to be here, be home now. My bio you read is actually five years old. So I've been home now seven years, yes, yes. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I wouldn't want to be no other place. You know, I feel blessed because I do have a job where I could come in with my abolitionist views and I got a whole crew of people that believe just like me and push it because I believe that if you want a lot, you have to de demand a lot. And uh, with Justice LA work, uh, not to toot my own horn, but we haven't lost a campaign yet. We haven't lost a campaign yet. And I say, because we fight with the community, it's very important to listen to what the community want. Because if you listen to what the community want, we can relate to what they want because we also feel that same way and going through the same things. So um, I just I'm um, glad to be here by the side by side by the people that was here for me when I didn't even know if I would ever be here. But uh, that's my story. Thank you. You're an inspiration, James. Thank you for giving back and for imagining alternatives and imagining diff a different way of being and a better way of being. That's what we all need to be doing. Our third panelist, last but not least, is Anthony Harris of Felon to Freeman. That's his organization. Um, he is a co-founder of the organization, which is based in New Hampshire and led by formerly incarcerated people organizing to support others to, quote, walk the path from prison to prosperity. He is also the manager of Roots National Hair Shop with his partner, Shaquanda Allen. 
He has become enthusiastically engaged with the Renew BIPOC Activist Network in New Hampshire and several grassroots organizations. Anthony was interviewed by Emmett Soldati for the State House Watch radio show on March 29th, 2020. And Yolanda will put the link to that really wonderful recording into the chat. He is a force of nature and brings a spirit of gratitude, joy, and determination to every situation. So Anthony, it's great to have you here and tell us a little bit more about your organization. Hello, all you kings and queens out there. I definitely appreciate being here. Um, I am the co-founder of Felon the Freeman. Um, I'm going to share, share my screen so I can uh, pull this slide up. Oh, Alert from Kelly. Wrong one. Facebook Alert. Homestead Environmental Report. There we go. Can everyone see my count? See, uh, see my screen? Okay. Yes. Um, so, Felina Freeman, um, how we how we came together, um, I, I did a five-year bid. And during, during my time, I seen that um, there was literally uh, no resources for me um, for the things that I actually, I wanted to do. I knew that I didn't want to go back uh, to doing what I was doing that got me in there. You know, I became crit since I was 13 years old. You know, uh, I was born a crack baby. You know, my mom was on crack cocaine. By the time I was five years old, my mom lost me and my siblings. So uh, my family saying they didn't want us to get lost in the system. My younger brother and sister went with my aunt in New York and me and my older brother went with my uncle. Well, my uncle turned out to be a very mean, nasty dude, you know, so for the next three and a half years until I was like eight and a half, almost nine, uh, I was sexually molested, physically abused, emotionally abused to the max, you know, and after that, my mom, after three and a half years, my mom overcame her drug addiction, but the damage was done already. And I internalized everything and I just became a very mean dude. And from that, you know, being raised in New York, outside my doors, drugs and gangs. So naturally that's what I fell into. And, and, um, by the grace of God, you know, he allowed me to keep my mind intact. So as I went in to do my five-year bid years later, um, I was figuring out what I wanted to do in life. I just knew I didn't want to go backwards. So um, I came out and, and um, as I was, I moved to New Hampshire and I met my queen. As I'm here, I meet my co-founder, uh, my, my mentor, my brother, and one of my best friends, Marquise Olison. And we, would, we, we kept going back and forth. And I wanted at first to just create a men's group, something to bring men back to being men, you know, and, and, and destroy this misconception of what a man is. Like uh, the misconception that men don't cry or it's weak for a man to cry. You know, when you don't cry, you 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 internalize you internalize feelings that should be uh, uh, you should be letting out, which can then in turn to animosity, hatred, and and um, a lot of anger, which will make it easier for you to boil over um, and produce violence. So um, as we're talking, I'm telling him how hard it is for me to get this job because I got these felonies on my record. And he's like, man, you know what? We went back and forth and Felon of Freeman was created. Um, we, 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 these are the problems that we've seen um, in our communities and in this nation that uh, made us want to create Felon of Freeman. You know, the recidivism, the rearrest rate for state prisoners was 83% over a nine year study. And, Although only 39.8% for nonviolent and 64% for violent federal prisons over an eight year prison, over eight year period. Um, the rehabilitation, you know, uh, the New Hampshire Department of Corrections 
Um, it says that in order to comply with Governor Christine's proposed budget, it would have to cut rehabilitation and educational programs that serve hundreds of inmates. And sorry, I got inmates up there. Uh, I was typing fast. I hate calling um, um, human beings and people, uh, my people that's locked up, inmates or felons. Those are titles that they gave us, and we don't accept those. Um, you know, and the reentry system, you know, surveys of former inmates suggest that 60 to 75 percent um, remain jobless up to a year after release. You know, and we know that it's hard. They say prison is meant to rehabilitate us. And after after when we go in, we're paying our debt to society. And and then they are to let us out and we've paid our debt. Well, that's what they say. But we know, first of all, a lot of a lot of people are being incarcerated. You know, um, where I'm at currently in New Hampshire, New Hampshire is over 96 percent white. Um, black people only make up 1.8 percent of this state, yet over 85 percent of the four prisons that are here are black and brown. And and so that data shows that you're targeting our communities. And, and so um, we decided to, to uh, our vision was to create a decarcerated owned and operated organization dedicated to assisting formerly incarcerated individuals and their families um, to successfully walk the path from um, prison to prosperity. You know, and um, our mission um, as Felina Freeman is to provide life coaching, job training, um, communication skills, uh, health and health and wellness um, counseling. You know, we got stress, man, um, stress man management. And um, we're working on right now housing. We know they have um, um, what they call the halfway house. We don't like that either. You know, the halfway house is just like, it, they say you got one foot in and one foot out, but really you're still locked up. You know, you let me go outside to get this job, but I got to walk on so many eggshells. I got to be super scared because if it, all it takes is one thing and then all they're doing is, oh, I'll send you back. I'll send you back. You better do this or I'll send you back. I mean, that's not freedom. You know, so um, we're implementing a plan right now called the quarter house where we're we have um, three, three in um, um, three house and four house uh, multifamily apartment buildings, and so that we will allow them to live there in a real apartment, so they can get the hang of actually coming home, paying bills. Yeah, you may have two or three roommates. Excuse me, depending on um, how many rooms, but it's more of a home feel. It's actually a home that you can build, you know, and um, from there. And um, our strategy for Felon the Freeman is primarily to focus on empowering formerly incarcerated individuals to have better possession of their conscious actions and their unconscious thoughts. We are intentionally positive while providing honest accountability and our programs are focusing on building, are focused on building upon that theory of change. You know, I love what, what, what the King James was speaking on. I mean, it's something that we talk about every day. Um, I'm also the decarceration organizer for American Friends Service Committee. And I'm also running for state representative for District 11, Ward 4, Manchester, New Hampshire. And so what we want to do is we have to bridge the gap between uh, activists and um, abolitionists community and government, you know, um, and, and I love what, what, what um, the King James um, and, and the King from ARC, uh, what their programs are doing and what they stand for, because this is so needed. I mean, Derek Chauvin, uh, he gets found guilty on, on, on all charges, which in my opinion, isn't justice, it's accountability. Um, and and uh, moments later, we have a beautiful queen slayed by a cop. Um, so it's, 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 we have to get out here 
and show our community. If we don't preach awareness, if we don't bring what we're doing to our community, then the, it's not gonna help the community. Um, I was just telling Yolanda, if, if, if Felina Freeman was strictly for Yolanda, but Yolanda didn't even know Felina Freeman existed, what, what does it matter what we have uh, uh, that can help her? So we have to bring this, uh, bring what, we, what we're offering to the community. And then we have to do what the um, King James said. You know, we have to ask the community, what do you want? What do you need? Um, what do you feel needs to be implemented into our community in order for us to feel safe, to, to feel like uh, we can rise, we can become um, what God created us to become, our full potential selves. And, um, and so um, these are a couple of things that are programs that that we're doing. Um, we had two, story, uh, two stories of redemption, um, where we're gonna have storytelling workshops. So um, we already had this in our launch party. Our launch event was called um, Felina Freeman, Two Stories of Redemption. So there's four of us and all four of us pretty much wrote our stories from beginning to end. And, and um, what we went through as a child that, that, that helped us into making the decisions that we made in life and um, how we overcame those decisions and what we're doing now in life to help others do the same. And um, I've, I've seen how powerful it is, a person's story, especially my own. You know, there was a time where I would have never told anybody that I, I, I was molested, you know, and my queen, uh, she's so phenomenal. She, she pretty much helped me with my story, you know, and, and, and she kept telling me, somebody else needs to hear this, babe. You got to tell the world, you know, you could be helping so many other people. And I was like, I'm never going to tell nobody I'm molested. You better not either, you know, and, um, finally I got the courage, you know, to, um, to be vulnerable enough to tell my story. And in doing so, uh, I met some more beautiful men that were like-hearted and like-minded and wanted to do the same thing. And, um, so we want to just show others, you know, the power and, um, in telling your story, the release that you get inside and in yourself, you know, the pressure that's let off of your shoulders and, and, and to, to abolish fear, fear as an acronym, uh, false evidence appearing real. You know, um, when you want, when you finally let it go, you see that you are surrounded with love and support, not not um, hatred and criticism. And um, and we we also started a podcast that first aired on April first. I um I drop these links into the chat as uh, as we move forward. Um, and our Pathfinders is our life coaching and, and um, supportive mentoring, our forever loaning, um, where growth through positive media and technology and our F2F um, um, action. You know, the trained decarceration organizers and voter registration, education and grassroots activism. So to show them uh, pretty much exactly how um, the King James and the King of Art is doing, you know, you were, you were locked up, you realize what you did as your mistakes, people fought for you to come home. And now you're doing the same thing. You're bringing people in, training them. Like, listen, just, we do have options. Our only option isn't just to sell drugs or play football for, for some sports team or something. We are, we are smart, uh, intelligent. We are, we are so resilient we are powerful beings. And I'm here to tell everybody, including the ones on the panel and the one that's listening, if nobody ever told you, you are loved, you are wanted, you are needed. You were created for a magnificent purpose on this earth. And if you don't have it, you got it from Anthony Harris and, and, and Felina Freeman, uh, all the love and support that you will ever need for anything. We are no, no judgment zone. Uh, as long as what you're doing isn't causing damage and effective to people's lives uh, or ours, yo, do you. We, we are here to just love you and support you. 
And if there's anything you need that we can provide, uh, um, please feel free to contact us. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we are going over time. So I will, I want to ask a little bit um, from the panelists if I can get come some consent to extend today's event to 15 more minutes um, to ask the questions that we have today. Um, if you can give a thumbs up, um, if that's okay. I'm sorry, I was trying to stop sharing, but I'm not sure how to do it right here. <laughs> hey, uh, I, I actually jumped on at the last minute for one of my colleagues. So what time was this actually supposed to end so I can know what 15 minutes mean? Um, it was supposed to end 11.15 your time. Um, I believe. Oh, because I, I do have a 12 o'clock appointment, but mm -hmm. I will stay on as long as I can. OK, thank you. All right, no problem. Great. Well, Anthony, that gave me the chills, actually. Um, so powerful. And, and I look forward to, to, to seeing if we could have the Dartmouth students work with your organization. Um, so I want to just start off the question, the Q&A, with, with a thread that I heard running through um, each one of your presentations, which is to go to the communities and see what communities need, as opposed to deciding from the top down, this is what we're gonna do, this is what is important, but to listen to what communities need. Now, we've all had a crazy, an amazing week, and also a kind of horrifying week in, in some ways, and also a really difficult year. We're, 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 we're all under the pandemic. So things have really changed in communities. Can you talk about how that those changes um, and also the kind of uprising we saw during the summer after George Floyd's murder, can you talk about how that's changed what, what you do and how you do your organizing and, act, and activism and, and what different kind of scales you work on? So uh, thank you for the question, Ivy. Uh, so first I want to, so I have two communities, but my primary community uh, exists of the people that are incarcerated. So when we decide which bills we're going to work on, what we're going to support or oppose is based on people that are incarcerated. And it's based on our membership that are formerly incarcerated. We have 77 employees, 75% of our employees are formerly incarcerated. Math, for the math people, that's 56 out of 77 people in this organization that have spent prison or juvenile uh, time. And so, in terms of how we've adjusted, most of it is virtual, but we've done some community events. What we've done in terms of inside the facilities, which we thought during this pandemic and, and with everything that was going on, we had to support our people inside. So what we did, we switched virtually. We created medium pieces uh, that we sent in to Juvenile Hall, the Department of Corrections, and had approved where we actually continue to provide rehabilitative programming. So each one of the team members walked them through different uh, uh, rehabilitative programs, used their life story, but we also sent in inspirational, motivational pieces uh, that basically said, we're still out here fighting for you. We know we can't come into the institutions, but we will not stop fighting for you. In addition to that, what we did, because California has a rather large prison system. We're, we're fourth now, we were third, uh, 35 prisons. Again, two of those are slated to be closed. and so. When they started having outbreaks of COVID in the prisons and everything that was going on, we had to focus on the people inside because they could not see anyone. So uh, we did a number of things through individual donors and some fundraising. Uh, we were able to donate thousands of bars of soap because in prison, you get one bar of soap every two weeks. And so we were able to donate thousands of bars of, of antibacterial soap hand sanitizer, mask, and literally drove them to the prisons that had outbreaks, delivered them, and made sure that the people in custody actually received them uh, via letters. We asked to make sure you write us and let us know that you've received these things. This is how much you should get. And so uh, in addition to that, one of the things that California did that in comparison to any other state was huge. There were a number of things through our advocacy work. We did two things. We advocated directly with the, the governor of the state of California and the state legislature. We did two things. First, we had 3,500 people released in, in March. Uh, and the way we did this, we gave the governor a list of ideas of how to release people. Then in August, we got the governor to, uh, and, and it's not just ARC, this is a coalition of organizations that, uh, which I'm proud to say, they have different views. 
but all we all agree that we all agree that we want to shrink this this prison system. We want people to come home. Uh, we were able to get another 8,500 people released from prison. In addition to that, we were able to get the governor, the state legislature, and our philanthropic uh, community to combine about $56 million to provide additional housing, transportation from incarceration. Literally, formerly incarcerated people would go to the prison, pick up people that were being released, and transport them, whether it's home to family or home to transitional housing like ours. Make sure that they have an amazing meal, make sure that they have clothing, toiletries, everything that they need before they're dropped off. And this was the, the, one of the most amazing parts. We were able to give first in LA County and then statewide, each person that came home, what we call a returning citizens debit card. As long as you plugged in with an organization and continued to do rehabilitative work and, and, and transition in, you were given $1,500 in three, three uh, increments uh, monthly. And so all of this happened at a time when the world was upside down and so we did a different form of organizing that was focused on the people on the, on the inside. Uh, the, the very last thing that we did, uh, and the governor agreed to, California was the first, if not the only state that agreed to put people that were in custody in the first phase of the vaccination. And so we, we also created a video where we were able to actually film some people that were incarcerated and people that were formerly incarcerated discussing the attributes why I should or should not take the vaccine in order to help people understand. And we also sent in thousands of leaflets, videos to explain exactly what the vaccine did, what were the trial periods so people would actually be informed. Now 40% of the population inside the Department of Correction is vaccinated. And that, that includes 60% of you include uh, uh, staff. Uh, so those are things that we organize differently uh, in terms of wanting to make sure that people in custody were safe. So, so that was where our, our main focus at. Uh, we focused with other organizations, some of the jail work in, in LA County, but our biggest focus because our prison system is so big, we said it, that uh, over 2,000 people, uh, like, uh, I mean, over 200 people died in California, in the state of California from COVID. And so we just wanted to make sure that we could do everything possible to make sure that they were safe. Um, James or Anthony, do you have anything you want to in, um, um, add to that? Yeah, I, I'll just say uh, when the pandemic had um, kicked in, uh, it, it, it was new to everybody. And uh, but we knew that we was needed now more than ever. Right. So, um, you know, it started off, you know, folks working remotely and everything going to Zoom. But what we realized was that 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 just because we was on Zoom, that the work wasn't going to stop, and the work proven to be even more uh, uh, effective, right? Because uh, during the elections and um, we was on the pandemic, but at the time though, we was still able to uh, 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 put information out and in and to get folks in in, in Zoom calls. And to, and to put the real information out there to get folks to get out and to get folks to get out and vote. And uh, and a good thing because across the board, like the community won everything across the ballot, right? So and that was on the pandemic. So so uh, the pandemic it, it, it was new to it. It was different. Uh, I would say the biggest thing for me is with the pandemic is. Uh, the relationship that DPN have with the students uh, really been like dampered because of uh, some students didn't have their own laptops. And, and then um, the schools themselves, they have a, a new issue going on with uh, uh, of surveillance, right? Uh, uh, kids is being surveillance in their homes. And uh, one instant, uh, the police was called out to that home for whatever they say that they seen on the Zoom call or it's called Schoology, Schoology, and uh, and the data is 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 if the, no consent was given by the parent or the student, and the data is being shared out with any and everybody. So you know, surveillance is a big thing. So that's one of the biggest things that I see that it have had an impact on our community, where the students is being even more impacted with the surveillance. I was just in a meeting yesterday, and uh, um, don't know for the life of me how we talking about. Uh, add more money to a police budget for them to do a face a face res uh, recognition. You know, uh, 
th these are the kind of things that's that's going on even in the pandemic. But uh, uh, we got to uh, stay the course, and uh, we can't give up no no momentum that we have gained because the things that we have pushed for. A lot of people told us it'll never happen, right? Uh, uh, one of the persons told us that was uh, uh, the ex sheriff, uh, 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 um, and now he's sitting in prison somewhere. And he told us that we wouldn't have a civilian oversight. You know, we was instrumental in getting a civilian oversight to oversight the um, sheriff department. And right now, um, the sheriff that's that's appointed now, uh, he still don't want to do right, even by the board of supervisors. So it's still a lot of things that got to be done because uh, we still have active gang members in these police uh, uh, departments. You know that he say that by law he can't do nothing about. You know, uh, but it's a lot of hot topics right now, but we all doing a lot of them still on Zoom. So uh, I'm just glad that uh, we was able to uh, stay the course and get some work done because, again, at the end of the day, uh, uh, it's some folks that need us. You know, we're here for a reason, you know, so uh, that's what I add to that. Thank you. Anthony, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, um, we were during would be like right pre pre the uh, the pandemic. Um, I was reporting for the Google News Initiative and Stringer Media. I was covering uh, the 2020 presidential election, um, and it was like pretty much the primaries here in New Hampshire. Um, that is actually around the time that uh, fell into Freeman start forming. It was really because it really got harder it was already hard enough with with felonies i just had pretty much got blessed with this reporting job they didn't know i had any felonies mm -hmm. and by the time they found out that i did have felonies on my record i had already got like four exclusive interviews with with uh two-time governor deval deval patrick uh um Andrew Yang, uh, um, the Senator of Jersey, Cory Booker, and and um, and so and and Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, and so then they they was like, oh my goodness, well, and that's the case. We're gonna forget about your felonies, but then sign this right here, uh, <laughs> saying that saying that uh, you're all the way done, and it's like a promissory note, I guess, um, and so. I I got I was just blessed, but that that like happens that's so rare, and I seen the ones that I was talking to they was asking me how'd you get and I'm like oh, I got blessed it was just a luck thing, you know and so as we're coming together as I was trying to put together this uh, men's group, um, the pandemic hits, and Governor Chris Sununu shuts down the state. Uh, now everybody has to go inside, put on this mask, and this disease is killing everybody, you know? And it just made it that much harder to actually organize and come together. You know, um, the Zoom thing wasn't really that big. Nobody wasn't really on the Zoom or any other platform like this, you know? The only really platforms, social media, you know, go on your Facebook Messenger or something, but, that was just for friends and we weren't really organizing, you know, being, being used to that, that, that face-to-face -face in-person camaraderie, building those rapports that was like instantly stripped away. So, um, it, 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 it like put a strain on us actually coming together to organize. Um, we were still able to do it between me and our co-founder um, but to get everybody else, it was like kind of hard because even if they were cool enough and they knew you, it was like they were so scared to have any type of human contact. And, and, and I wasn't dealing with a lot of people that, that had the money to pay to can afford uh, Comcast internet every month, you know, can afford that $80 every single month. So it put a strain on us, but we, we, we found a way, um, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And, and now we're just, now we're coming together. It's a lot more easier for us now throughout this, throughout this pandemic. Um, 
kind of know how to work with Zooms and the team Teamsters meetings and everything like that. So, um, and and you've seen the police got crazy. I don't know what this pandemic did to them, but it's like they were already oppressing us crazy. It would seem like COVID was like a disease for them to just kill us, kill us even more at, at a faster rate. And like blatantly, blatantly, like while everybody's recording them and it, it just, it told me personally, like, like they just didn't give a damn. And, and they felt deep in their being that they can do this and get away with it. And then they were actually doing it. I mean, like, like I said before, I mean, the only one was Derek Chauvin. He's the only one guilty on all charges, but yet uh, I don't see that as justice. That's not justice. When you kill somebody, that's what you're supposed to do. You know, especially when you do it so the whole world can see you and you put your knee on someone's neck for eight minutes and, well, the trial said nine minutes and 26 seconds. You know, so um, I feel that finally for once, America, white America has stood up and took in accountability for what this man has done. And, and that's what I take that for. But I think we still have a long way to go because as we've seen, Right after he was uh, convicted on all counts, uh, we have another queen being slayed by a cop. So um, um, until until we actually start start that conversation, including with cops, I watched this movie called American Skin, and it gave me a whole pers new perspective on looking at. It. I'm like, not necessarily go do what they did, but let's let's have a movie night with cops in the community and let's put on a movie like american skin let's start these hard conversations with them maybe we could convert them also maybe they actually start seeing you know uh uh when they're confronted with these truths and and they can't give the political answer as and and, and you know um things of that sort so it's 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 hurt in a way but then in another way, it, it allowed us again to, to show how, how resilient we are and, and how innovative we are to no matter what happens, we will stay the course and we 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 will continue to push until until uh either either uh it changes for the better, the betterment of communities around the country, or God calls me home. Thank you. Awesome. I have a question from the from one of our audience members, um, uh, actually a former student of mine, Rosie Kerr, who is now the uh, director of our sustainability um, uh, organization. And she says there's lots that needs to change. But if folks on this call did one thing to help, what would you have us do? The one thing that people can do. I'll say the one thing, and and the one thing I would say, uh, I don't know uh, what state our folks is from, but I know like here in LA with the gentrification that's been going on, and then uh, you have like a uh, uh, young white folk, older white folks moving into a community that was once uh, 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 occupied by blacks or or, or or brown folks, right? And 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 they quick to call the police for small. Are, are probably no issues and, and, and people are, are getting hurt. People are getting murdered, you know, uh, uh, when these police show up, just like the brother just spoke about the young sister that called about a fight, right? Uh, she, she still shouldn't have lost her life, right? It, it's, it's a lot of other things that could have happened and she could have at least still been breathing. So I would just say, don't be quick to call the police if there's one thing that you can do. I would say get involved in your, your, your legislative process. Be aware of what laws are being passed. Uh, for instance, if we look at Georgia, the voting rights, that, should, that voting rights bill should never have been passed. Be informed, read, read, please, and understand the impact of the laws that are being pa passed and, and, and contact your representative so that they know which way you want them to vote. 
right? The, the most powerful thing you can do is be informed. Uh, oftentimes, sadly, there's misinformation that's put out uh, and it, it causes confusion. It causes people not to, not to, some people get so confused, they just don't want to vote. But if, if we're informed, if we take the time to read, if we take the time to understand what's going on, we can plug in. And so uh, specifically, uh, get involved uh, in your legislative process and if possible, especially for our young people, if you have time to mentor or to assist in some type of way, young people need support. Young people need support. That's why I still spend my Saturdays in juvenile hall. Every chance I get, I'm, I'm working with young people. Uh, they need support. They need to know that we believe in them and they need to know that they have a bright future. All they need to know need to do is just plug into the right networks and the right people so they can move forward. Anthony, do you wanna give us your one thing? Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, King Sam just pretty much said it. Um, get involved. Um, you know, our presidential election it is, is, yes, that general election is import, important. But what's more important is our local level. See, these are the politicians here at your local level that are literally directly affecting your household. They're the ones that's in your city, in your ward. That's that's controlling the budget. Where where the money that's coming into this to your city, where it's, where it's going? If your kid is gonna have this program or not? You know, uh, the inner city, we don't really have the money like that to afford to send our kid to these charter schools, to these private schools. So we need we need musical education. You know, we need these after school programs, and these are the these are the programs that are being cut. So get involved. With, with, with your local level um, politics. And if, if um, and like, like, like the King said, be informed. Know who your politicians are. If you don't want to actually become one, at least know who they are so you know who you're voting for and why you're voting for them. You know, uh, um, learn what bills are being pushed. Right now in New Hampshire, they got this bill, House Bill 40, uh, 544, and we're trying to demolish this. They, they, I think they, they ITL'd the bill, for y'all don't know the language, I think they just killed the bill. But what the Republicans did is they took some language out of the bill and put it into our budget. And now that budget is sitting on, a, in, on our Senate floor. And we have to, and this bill is saying that there is no racism in the United States or New Hampshire. So we're not allowed, we won't be allowed to speak on racism in our government or our schools. We can't teach our children that one race had oppressed another or anything like that. So pretty much basically we wouldn't be able to speak the truth. And they will be able to continue to teach our kids these lies such as Christopher Columbus was a beautiful guy and he was a beautiful person. That's what they taught me in elementary. He discovered America, come to find out he was one of the horrible, most horrible people in the world. He, 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 he raced a whole race of people, genocide. You know, he was selling women into sex slavery. But yeah, America has this guy as celebrated once a day, but that's another subject, you know? And, um, and, and so we need to be informed of the things that are happening. These bills are, they're getting pushed through like this. You know, we just had um, 173 bills and out of 173 bills, I think, we got like 50 of them through, 60 of them through, you know? Um, and, and so you, you must be informed of what's going on in your city. What are these politicians saying to you, but what are they actually doing? You know, what are they cutting and taking from you? You know, uh, um, your, your police commissioner, you, you, we, we vote them in, you know, we have to, uh, uh, your city council, you know, uh, your aldermans, you have to go and see who these people are and what they stand for and what they want to implement in your com community. It's the community that you live in, so it affects you. So um, I just wanted to uh, pretty much echo what the King Sam said from ARC. Um, get involved and, and stay informed. So important and, and also start local. This is what we tell our students. You know, they want to start on the huge level and it's like, no, no, start out at your local jail and see what's going on there and what you can do for those folks. So we really we really emphasize that, start local. I have to say, I, 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 I tend to work, uh, the, 
we work in the Sullivan County House of Corrections, which is in Unity, New Hampshire. Um, but I live in Vermont. I moved to Vermont so I could vote for Bernie um, all those years ago. Um, another comment from Margarita Wren. She says, thank you so much for sharing your stories and analyses. Really appreciate how everyone emphasizes resilience through relationships and recognizing political slash bureaucratic structures as obstacles to strategize around while the vision is always just seeing people loved and eating well. Thinking about this week of action to free Ashley Diamond. So I wanted to turn that into a question for all of you. It's really easy for activists to get burnt out. Um, how do you renew yourselves? What, how do you, what do you do? Are there the specific things that you do? I mean, you've hinted at some of them, but what would you recommend for those young activists who just, for them not to get burnt out in this very, uh, in the in the situation where everything is fraught and there is so much to do, I would suggest uh, for me what I do is I exercise, I eat right, I get get at least seven hours of sleep. If I can, I'll, I'll, I'll go for eight. Uh, I meditate, and when I feel that I'm getting to that point, I unplug for a day or two. Like I, I literally unplug. Come January 12th, I will have been freed for 10 years after being incarcerated for 24 years. I've never taken a real vacation. So I'll take two days off and just unplug from all electronics, go hang out at the beach, uh, hang out with my family, grandkids, but literally just unplug. I don't watch TV. I will, I'll I watch movies, but I won't watch TV because I, if, if I don't, one of my mentors taught me this. And, and he said it in a loving way. He said, I'm not concerned about you per se. He said, I'm concerned about the work. And the work that you lead and the work that you do is important. So you have to take care of you. <laughs> and I said, but what about me? He said, you heard what I said. So literally uh, do those things. And for me, it's, it's uh, again, I'm going on tape. I've never had a vacation since I've been released from uh, incarceration. And I average at least a, a, a minimum of a 12 hour day. Yeah, I'll keep my short because as I was saying, I do have to go. But uh, we do it, we keep it simple uh, at DPN. Uh, we just encourage folks, we just encourage, encourage folks to take self-care. You know, uh, my, my supervisors, I, they, they, they come down on us if they find out we don't take uh, self-care. But you know what's unique though about this work as for choosing to be an organizer, right? Because that's what it all started with, a great organizer, you can do anything else, right? And and the thing is, though, uh, uh, the system is so stressful <laughs> and to tear you down. So uh, 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 you have to take some time out for yourself, because if you're not well and, and strong and able, uh, who are you against the system that's so big and well all right? And then um, something else that, that, that we do is uh, we just, uh, uh, just take trips just because, you know, uh, we, get, we get bonuses just for self-care. So we big on po uh, folks and we have a, a health and wellness team as well that offer uh, uh, different kind of uh, remedies for stress related work, uh, uh, acupuncture, uh, Reiki, uh, uh, masseuses and different kind of herbal teas as well, right? They hook up uh, little care packages and that's something else we've been doing during the pandemic as is having a, 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 a response team as far as answering the community needs and wants and stuff. And uh, I don't keep up with all the data, but they have really like reached out and touched a lot of families and women that had kids and babies that they needed to feed and uh, formula. And, uh, you know, we even passed out uh, vaccine kits and, and uh, uh, when they was testing for it and stuff. And also helped folks in South, and, um, San Quentin get a lawsuit going that, uh, uh, that was in there suffering through that COVID situation. So. You know, that's just some of the things we do. But uh, I thank you guys for inviting me to be here and uh, appreciate you guys. Yeah, thank you for coming, King. Uh, uh, it was a blessing meeting you. I will, I will uh, appreciate it if you would, um, before you go, if you could just throw your information in the chat so I could get in contact with you. And also, um, Sahara, um, I, you, you were supposed to be on the panel and you weren't, can I, would you like to say something? And you put a lovely comment in the chat, but I would love to hear from you and perhaps you can have the last word. 
Of course, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Sahara. My pronouns she, her, hers, and I'm a field organizer with Dignity and Power Now. Um, I'm gonna keep it real short because I want to be, uh, you know, of everybody's time. I know we got two minutes left, but um, I just want to thank you guys, like, all for being here. If I had one thing to say um, on one of the questions that was asked, um, if how you can get connected, all I was saying is. Um, one thing you can do is to listen. Uh, ignorance is not bliss. Um, to educate yourself and listen to what's really going on and being said before you choose to get involved so you really know like what you're standing for and what you're, you're fighting for. Um, it's a lot, of, a lot of things that could get you thrown off track to, you know, for what, what you originally started fighting for. But just, just always remember and um and stay true to that because at the end of the day you you know we're fighting for community and that's what it's about bringing us back together and um like anthony said earlier like you know we are love so love one another yolanda do you want to say something to to take us out um, a huge thank you, I would like to say, uh, a, a huge thank you for your attention today. Um, and also, um, I had to hold back tears throughout this whole panel. I um, come from East Los Angeles, California and Boyle Heights. Um, so I, I commend the work that's done. Um, you put me here where I am right now. Um, I'm getting theory. <laughs> um, I wouldn't have been here at Dartmouth, um, now graduated 2019. Um, I'm hoping to go back um, in August. So you'll see me maybe um, raising havo uh, havoc in LA soon. <laughs> um, but just wanted to give you, a, uh, give you all a huge thank you for the work that you do. Um, and honestly, uh, just trust in, in the power of the work that you do and just connecting. Um, and so today we just wanted to give that um, space to connect, um, to continue raising um, just awareness of each other's movements um, to keep showing up. Um, that's definitely um, kind of what I wanna say. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs>